Hello, and welcome to our discussion about sequencing and monitoring for toxicity, symptom management, pain control, and when should care focus primarily on palliation rather than aggressive treatments. I'm Hope Rugo, a professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco's Comprehensive Cancer Center, and my focus is on breast medical oncology. I'm joined by two fabulous colleagues, Dr. Mike Raybaugh at the University of California, San Francisco, and Dr. Rishma Matani at uh, the Florida Baptist Hospital. Uh, Mike, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do? Absolutely. Thank you, Hope. Yeah, so my name is Mike Rabo. I'm a palliative care physician, and I'm a professor in the Division of Palliative Medicine at UCSF. I'm the medical director for palliative care in our cancer center, and uh, I supervise and organize a group of palliative care specialists of multiple different uh, specialties to support patients who are going through cancer and cancer treatment. Great, thanks. And Rishma. Great. Uh, happy to be here. Reshma Matani. I'm a breast medical oncologist. I'm chief of breast medical oncology at Miami Cancer Institute, uh, Baptist Health, South Florida. And I am really interested in this area. I think oncology has um, evolved arguably more rapidly than any other field in medicine. And we've had the opportunity to have great successes in cancer diagnostics and new treatments and it's really um, an opportunity for us to help patients navigate all that cross, uh, progress. And uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a privilege to do so. Great, uh, thanks so much. And this is really a great group for myself. I've been very interested in uh, working with our symptom management group run by Mike and uh, palliative care group and our patients with advanced breast cancer. And we've piloted a variety of different approaches to this and also in symptom management where I also work with the Multinational Association for Symptom Management and uh, Cancer. So there's a lot of different areas, I think, that uh, cross all of our interests here. I'll start with Reshma. And uh, really, in uh, treating patients with breast cancer, uh, one of the things that we run into, and I think this crosses different malignancies, obviously, based on the number of choices we have, is trying to balance efficacy with preferences. And obviously, this happens in the early and late stage setting, but Maybe we'll focus on metastatic uh, disease. How do you really balance uh, the treatment choices that you offer patients, and how does the multidisciplinary team play a role? Yeah, I think that's a great question, and it's something that we battle with every day. Um, we we tend to be very focused on the efficacy of our treatments, but uh, equally important is the toxicity profile of these treatments. And I think as I have these discussions with patients, it's really important to spend time understanding what's important to them uh, in terms of their lifestyle, what they do for a living, whether they are um, open to treatments that cause hair loss or if that's something that's very important to them to not lose their hair. Uh, I think understanding what's driving them, what their preferences are, and we use this terminology shared decision-making quite a bit uh, I think that it's really an approach where we're, as clinicians uh, and patients, sharing together the best available evidence um, when we're faced with making a decision, and we're really supporting patients to consider options so that they uh, achieve informed preferences. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great uh, way of putting it. I think that this uh, sharing in decisions and maybe the most important word was supporting patients and their decisions. So, you know, sometimes we think a patient should go on one treatment, but they're not willing to take the risk of a certain toxicity. And it could be something as non-life-threatening as hair loss that impacts quality of life for our patients so much. And also the number of visits that patients come in, their general uh, assumptions. I think we, you know, we want patients to help patients make decisions, but we also want to support them uh, when they decide to take a path that maybe not is not the one we recommend it. Um, and having options is important too. Uh, certainly one of the big things that comes up with our patients when we're um, making decisions for treatment in the metastatic setting is understanding that there's always an option for not taking the next treatment and when that decision is the right one. Uh, and trying to t have a conversation about that without removing hope for patients and 
also trying to not impact their feeling that we're supporting them and have their survival at our uh, best interests is really difficult. Mike, can you talk a little bit about that? Because that's really front and center to what you do. Yeah, absolutely. I really like the discussion about shared decision-making and I, I think that that continues no matter what the stage of the cancer or the situation is because in a way we can conceive of patients of, as having an expertise as well that goes into the mix of all the different uh, expertises that are coming from our team. So patients are expert in them, in themselves, in what matters to them and what's important to them. And that expertise is key in figuring out uh, the treatments to pursue. I think that the biggest, biggest opportunity is for us to be able to link the care that we want to provide, that we're able to provide with the goals that people have. And so goals of care conversations are so important because it's really only knowing what the goal is that we can construct treatments and treatment regimens that make sense uh, for everybody involved that we think are both efficacious and desired. And so I think we all as clinicians um, can continue working on getting better at initiating goals of care conversations, about having those conversations. Um, obviously, the best time to have that conversation is right in the beginning, uh, before we know whether or not various treatments have been successful or not. So we really, really can sort of behind that veil of ignorance about treatment efficacy, really get into the details of what is most important to people. And so I we, we talk technically about a goals of care conversation. I think ultimately it's really about trying to figure out from patients what matters most to them, what are the most important things. And th then we as clinical experts can help design uh, treatments and offer treatments and options that help patients achieve their goals. Uh, helping patients achieve the goals that we have for any particular clinical outcome is really not the point. It's about helping patients achieve what their goals are. And their goals may include living as long as possible, but they might include other things as well in terms of quality of life, in terms of being able to function or not lose various functions. Um, so really, it's that link between care and goals uh, that I think is our opportunity in a goals of care conversation. I think one of the challenges that we run into a lot of times working on our own as oncologists is that when we start talking about goals of care, people are really afraid that we're going to not support treatment or not support looking for best treatment options that will help them live longer. And then many of our patients, despite the fact that we talk to them all the time about metastatic breast cancer not being a curable disease, may really hold on to the idea that the next treatment will get rid of the cancer. How do you deal with that, Rishma, in practice? Uh, you know, the... And how do you interrelate with other providers in the multidisciplinary care model to try and manage that expectation and discussion? Yeah, these are really hard discussions. And I think that the important point to kind of um, recognize here is that it has to be a team approach and it takes um, a village to take care of these patients and support them in the way that they need. As medical oncologists, we have so many things on our on our task list that we have to go through with patients in terms of toxicities of therapies, schedule, dose, um, talking to them about financial issues that they may be having, tolerance issues. And so here's where the multidisciplinary team really is very important. But I think it's also important to be very upfront uh, when we're having a conversation about metastatic disease, I, I think that it's a careful balance between, like you said, taking away that hope, but also giving them a realistic uh, explanation of where they are in their disease process. And it happens with time and with um, a sort of trust that develops. And, and I think that's what's so special about the relationship between a medical oncologist and our patients. It's one of the things that really drew me uh, to breast cancer. Yeah, certainly to oncology and then within breast cancer, it also was one of the areas that uh, drew me to this uh, to this specialty. Uh, but, you know, Mike, it brings up a big, uh, I think, question. One of the things that Mike does, which I think is just so special and useful, is send out these communication tips uh, to the cancer center. Uh, I think you send it cancer center-wide, right, uh, Mike? And I think that 
that's just an, uh, really an amazing service because some of these things people just don't even think about. You know, there are these pictures now uh, that are cartoons on the web that pop into your inbox where you have the computer and the doctor is looking at the computer and the patient sitting over here at the patient saying, you know, doc, you know, they're asking some critical question. And the doctor is looking at the computer because of the electronic health record. Um, so uh, one of the questions I think, uh, Mike, is, you know, we have this idea of a multidisciplinary team, et cetera. But, you know, part of that is the patient team as well. So uh, maybe uh, two things. One is when do you bring the family in? When do you insist? You know, a lot of people are very independent. Um, they don't, you know, want somebody you know, they don't want to feel like they're dependent on somebody, right? And uh, I see that a lot of my uh, patients. And on the other hand, I've also had a patient who was really at the end of life and her sons came in and were like, had, were clueless. You know, they had no idea what was going on. And that was really a bad situation. So when do you bring in the family? How do you bring it in? They may not be available during the day. And what kind of tips do you think in the last year were the ones that you would share uh, with us today? Yeah, it's really an important question. And uh, in routine circumstances, it's always going to be the case in sort of the culture that we have in the United States, at least, that uh, patients get to decide who they want to be involved in their care. They get to decide who their loved ones are or who uh, is their family of choice, as is sometimes uh, labeled. And I think respecting that is a really important part of just respecting the personhood of the patient. I think it's very, very reasonable, again, right from the very beginning, as you're finding out sort of what work someone's done or where they live, uh, to find out um, who's important to them, who helps them live the life that they want to live, who else's life uh, is important for them uh, to, to uh, coordinate uh, with, and to take seriously uh, the folks who they choose and the folks who they choose not to have involved. I think that's an important point of respect as well. I think that we as clinicians can raise uh, the question of if you ended up needing more help, who would you turn to? Um, to really broaden the discussion to future possibilities as well. And for sure, the last year of life, though it's uh, difficult or impossible for us to figure out when that is, um, I think is reasonably estimated by us as clinicians asking ourselves the question, would we be surprised if our patient died in the next year? That, that's a question, a prognostic estimate that actually has some evidence behind it in terms of being relatively reasonably accurate to really at least identify folks who might be in the end period of their life. And then the advice I routinely give uh, to patients who are open to hearing it uh, is that it's usually later than we think. It's later than we think because sometimes people uh, might have literally less time than we thought that they did. They might die, develop liver metastases or other complications that become very, very serious very quickly. It's also later than we think because people um, lose sometimes their ability to enjoy their life as uh, deeply and as fully as they would like to. And so although people may be alive, they may have lost their ability to fly on a plane or their ability to walk, which really curtails the activities that they might want to have gotten done. So essentially the right time to do all these things that are important is immediately. That's always, I think, the correct answer. Um, and then coordinating with, uh, with and around treatments to figure out uh, more specifics um, always makes sense. Yeah, that's one thing that came up during COVID, right, where we would walk in the room and patients didn't have family members or that support system. And that that was always something that kind of struck me as very sad. But to your point, Mike, sometimes patients don't don't want to have anybody else involved at that moment. And we have to be very respectful of what their wishes are. No, it's a good point. And, uh, you know, it's a funny thing, actually, because we did have patients, it was just uh, really traumatic, I think, for the oncologists also that, you know, patients who had a limited time of life were so curtailed during the uh, the height of the pandemic. And one of my patients was an older woman who played a lot of games, you know, like cards and other things, you know, which I don't do any of. And, uh, but she liked doing those things. So we, I said, you know, look, you can do them online with your friends, even next door. So we went through this whole thing with, you know, the help of the front desk and everyone to get her a iPad so that and 
teach her to get online with her neighbor and so that she could play those games and she's still playing them today. So that was a good thing. So there are little things you can do with your staff that can vastly and you know improve and open the quality of life. But one of the things I think we run into sometimes is the patient says, you know, I'd like I'd like to go to the Philippines next, you know, Christmas holiday for a month. <laughs> like uh you know, and that's a year and a half from now, you know. So uh we we do have those challenges and it can be really difficult. Mike, you sometimes have um, interesting communication tips. I wonder if maybe you could just share one or two of those tips with us. Absolutely. I, I think in some ways, especially when we're talking about uh, someone's cancer situation changing, uh, a you know the disease becoming resistant to a treatment, uh, is the idea of uh, framing the communication, framing the interaction, uh, how people are, you know, a month into or a year or five years into their disease, it might be very different from how it was on day one when you first met. And so I think it's very useful to use kind of communication signposts to help people identify that you're, you're saying something very important. Um, Around goals of care discussions, it might be something like, uh, you know, Mr. So-and-so or Ms. So-and-so, um, I think we're in a different place now. And sort of let that kind of comment sink in so people either understand what you're talking about because you, they just had their scans and it showed progression, or they can ask what you're referring to in particular. But it gives everyone a chance to recognize that new thinking is required, new understanding, new recognitions are required because you're in a different place. And I think those kinds of, um, of framing statements, I think they're a little bit of a warning shot as well, allow people to take the conversation with the seriousness that it, that it requires and with the creativity that is now necessary to try and recalculate and refigure out um, how we're going to integrate what matters most to the patient and what might be the most effective and efficacious treatments. I, I did also want to um, offer one communication tip around um, an issue that I know is quite common, uh, which is uh, a situation where uh, patients are expressing a hope for something that we, we might not feel is uh, realistic. And it's quite clear for most patients, hopes can be nested. They may be wishing to go to the Philippines next Christmas, but if that isn't possible, they may be willing to go to the Philippines now. Uh, and if that's not possible, they may be willing or interested in having a Zoom celebration with their family from the Philippines. So this idea that people's hopes are real and important, but what's realistic uh, may need to nest within a larger hope that may no longer uh, be technically possible. So that leads into, I think, one of the key communication tips, which is this idea of a communication formulation around uh, what you hope for and what you worry about. Hopes and worries in, in some ways are the very core of palliative care. And so you might be able to say something like, I really hope for a miracle as well. I really hope that this experimental treatment does exactly what you're hoping it will do. I hope that too. And also, I worry about what will happen if that's not true. I worry about your ability to get to the Philippines if you do this treatment that uh, might be very, very burdensome. And so connecting both our hopes and uh, potentially our worries about reality um, is a nice way to both maintain a connection with patients as well as expressing our our concern and our love for them um, at the same time needing to make realistic and practical decisions and allowing people to consider uh, how they want to go about making decisions in the context of the reality as we understand it. Yeah, I think those are such important. I love the idea of the hope and the reality balancing. And I think offering alternatives. You know, if you want to go on this really grand trip to Europe, it might be a good idea to plan that in the next few months because we don't really know what the future will hold, although we have our hopes. 
Krishna, one of the things that we also struggle with as oncologists is, you know, what we do for symptom management and how best to manage symptoms that maybe to some degree really create a huge burden on our electronic health record, can engage our staff, et cetera. Managing pain has become an incre increasingly difficult thing. We thought we had a better idea of it, but now, you know, a lot of times the insurance doesn't even want us to give them narcotics. What is your what are your clinical pearls for that important area? Yeah, I think you know the the management of symptoms is such an important part of what we do because all of these drugs that we have available, um, they're only as good as our ability to keep patients on them, right? So without managing the toxicity profiles um, of of all of these drugs, we're we're not really helping our patients because we we don't want to have them have this ba undue balance of, you know, more toxicity than, um, than we're expecting. And in certain cases, certain patients do have worse toxicities with certain therapies. And here's where I think it's really important to engage with um, members of our team like pain management and referrals to palliative care early on, right? Because I think a lot of patients get worried when we make a referral to palliative care because they think of that as palliative care slash hospice, and they think that we are putting them in a different category. And I'm very mindful of um, referring patients to palliative care very early on in the process to help with symptom management. And I'm very upfront about that with all my patients. I'm referring you not because I, I think that you're at a point where we don't have additional therapies, but we need some help on getting your symptoms under control and I think that's very well received. No, that's a great point, I think. And, you know, also we always have to keep in mind that dose reductions and changing schedule, you know, two weeks on, one week off can be every other week and that there are a lot of different, um, I think, global recommendations and guidelines for symptom management that we should always access NCCN, um, ESMO, the Advanced Breast Cancer Consensus Panel and others. But I think that NCCN, which updates, you know, every time new data comes out is a really useful resource and also can be provided to patients as well um, as it's free to print on the web as, you know, just to make sure people understand it. But um, this is useful for our staff, too. Uh, we've are, you know, had a great conversation, kind of run out of time, but I want to give both of you the opportunity to just make some closing comment. Rish Reshma. Yeah, I think, you know, this is a very important area and thank you for the opportunity to be involved in this discussion. I think um, recognizing that we need to be very mindful of what our patients want and having them uh, or allowing them to have a voice uh, uh, is a very important part of, of what we do as breast oncologists. And as we mentioned, engaging other members of the team, our APPs, our nurse navigators, our palliative care colleagues, and really looking at this as a team approach, um, those would be my closing comments. And Mike. Yeah, I, I love I love that comment about the team. And I think my comment would probably focus in on the clinician, individual clinician, him or herself. Um, for all of us to remember that we might have various roles and relationships with patients. Sometimes we're supporting patients, sometimes we're partnering with patients. Sometimes we're leading patients. Sometimes we're even sort of in a parental relationship, which is not an evil thing. Uh, to be maternal or paternal in the right situation makes a lot of sense. Sometimes we are merely bearing witness to the experience of another human. And so we have a very, very sophisticated kind of relationship with patients. And I think being clearer about that and being reflective about that and thoughtful about that will help us all uh, avoid burnout to build our own resiliency so that we can continue doing this work because everybody is working hard to take beautiful care of patients and we we can't be in the long-term process of harming ourselves in that context and so i think really paying attention to what our relationship is with patients and how it is we can continue to serve patients even in the setting of very serious and and uh sometimes terminal disease um is is key for all of us to keep doing this important work We've had a fabulous panel discussion today, and my closing comment is, for providers in the oncology field, we need to also take care of ourselves. And that's a really important area to focus on. And similar to what our patients do, the same solution might not be right for everyone, and it rarely is. 
So I think it's important for all of us to think about what makes each one of us happy, what gives us the support to keep doing what we do in the most effective way to help our patients, but also protect ourselves and keep ourselves um, as functional and helpful as possible throughout this course. Thank you so much for listening and uh, participating in this conversation. Thank you, Rishma and uh, Mike, for your great comments.